D N T show is intended for mature audiences. Parental discretion is advice. Live long and prosper, bitches. Friends with benefits. <laughs> Speaking of having a good time, Terry. Mm-hmm. Dayton broke the G and T show. This is now the David Mac <laughs> appreciation <laughs> hour. You assholes. <laughs> what is it about this guy that people love him so much with his purple velvet cape and his crown? I thought it was a little much when he had us carry him in the studio on a throne. I am awesome. <laughs> Look what I have brought upon the world! There is an urge to go nyan, 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 nyan. I heard rumors that you might be working on something else, but we won't pry much. <laughs> I'm, gonna say it. I'm gonna pry a little. <laughs> dare you! How dare you ask me to change it? Do you not understand the majesty of my genius? <laughs> and the guy sitting next to me looked at me like he was, you know, like I'd crapped in his hat. Yeah, it's the professionalism yeah. that sells the show. That's right. We here at the GNT Show would like to extend our condolences to the fans and friends of Harold Ramis, who not only blended sci-fi and comedy, but influenced many of the people that listen to us and write. You will be missed. Welcome to this GNT Supplemental Log. This is Gettysburg 7. And to my left, your right, wearing her, it looks like she's trying to wear the Black Canary outfit, but she's kind of mixing in some Huntress. It's Terry Lynn. Hello. <laughs> That would be me. Yeah. <laughs> it's still the boots. It's all about the boots. And That's none right. other. Exactly. And to <laughs> my right, your left, wearing his uh, ceremonial, uh, it's like a mixture of Centauri, Narn, and Klingon. He's going for something different here. Ceridium. <laughs> Kapla! The Centauri is the hair. Yeah, yeah. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> that, would, that would be a really cool look on the Klingons. Yeah, it would. <laughs> it's a real genre bender. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And there you hear our special guest this week returning, because evidently he's into BDSM. It's Larry <laughs> Demichak. <laughs> well, some Welcome of back, Larry. are a little sicky spell, aren't they? Just bouncing <laughs> off the walls. Boomer Sooner. <laughs> oh, Boomer Sooner. Yeah, bring me out of it. Oh, I haven't talked to you Welcome since there. the Sugar Bowl. Whoop. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Larry. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Glad to have you. Good hey, to can you tell I've been doing a Babylon 5 rewatch? <laughs> oh. Um, no, I, but okay. I haven't seen it in 15 years, so I, I'm just finishing up season one now. Oh, oh right on. Okay. And wow, that was strong from the word go. I did not remember how strong that series was. Now, when you say you started from the word go from day one, they had didn't they have like one or two miniseries before they went to episode episodes? Yeah, they had in the beginning and the gathering. Okay, and, so when you and I'm you, talking from episode one of the the actual series itself. Okay, are they like uh, I- instrumental or are they helpful or are they optional or? No, you kind of got to see them. I saw. I saw it. Yeah. Yeah, he 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 planned everything out and doing some reading. I think it's interesting. There was absolutely no ad libbing allowed because he was he everything was that planned out. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Now, Larry, Larry, where do you the, the oh, whole yes. the whole DS Nine Babylon Five thing? Do you think that was coincidence or did Paramount know and kind of do the same thing? I I never got a chance to like well. I, I don't think Michael Piller ripped off J. Michael Straczynski. I will no, say that because it was be Michael fair, and Rick's thing, huh? Yeah, to be fair, he's even said that, that they didn't, but he thinks somebody higher at Paramount did. Well, they, I mean, they had the Bible that he had written. Yeah, well, he pitched to, he did pitch to Paramount and all that. But that's a little bit like Gene saying, well, I pitched Star Trek to CBS first, and those bastards, then they didn't buy my show, but they went and did Lost in Space, and they picked my, you know, they picked my brain for all their ideas. And you're like going, oh, well, okay. <laughs> I can, you know, I can see a little bit of what he's saying, but not really. So, I mean, they're both space station shows and all that, but the logic of, Wanting to do something ra- not radically different than next gen, but but all the um, you know the pendulum swing that I always talk about. And after happy dappy bright shiny TNG, they wanted to do something different. 
and uh, have have more drama involved. And and so they thought, well, if we don't do a ship and we don't do another Enterprise, what do we do? Well, we either do a colony on a planet or we do a space station. And you know, and that whole that whole train of thought that led them to DS9, the Fort the Fort Dodge, you know, on the prairie kind of thing. So I I know it seems like a lot of coincidences, but um, I don't. You know, what I want to know is why did Ron D. Moore rip off Battlestar Galactica from DS9? Now that's the big one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, There's right. the unanswered <laughs> scandal. Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting question, though. I I myself have have never seen an episode of Babylon Five at all. So really? I would, gasp. Actually, no, I have, really. Yeah, Terry, yeah. I think you would really enjoy it. I'm sure I would. And trust me, it's on the list. But I have to get through Farscape first. Oh, you know, I watched one episode of Farscape and haven't been back, and it's not because I didn't enjoy it. I just haven't been really back. Right. Haven't been back. Yeah. Now, to be fair, I think during oh. when the shows were running, there was a they had a softball game between crews from the two sh- from uh, Babylon Five and DS Nine. Did they really? Yeah. Really. And Babylon Five won, and they made up these T-shirts. It said something like Babylon Eleven DS Seven or something, and that was. <laughs> <laughs> I, to, I may have one of those T-shirts around here somewhere. Right, right. That's cool. I now, one of the know. one of the cool Trek things, though, is uh, Michelle Barrett went on Babylon Five as kind of a bridge between the two fandoms to say, "Look, we're all one big, you know, fandom collectively. Let's why have these arguments?" Right, right. And and you know, Walter Koenig was Bester on Bester. He was great. Mm-hmm. Yes, he was so thrilled to have that because I mean, he, you know, he will always be. Grateful <laughs> for 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 Chekhov, you know. Obviously, I mean, I, who knows where he, you know, where his notoriety might have been in in the world if it had he never gotten eh, Chekhov. As much as you like to, right? You know, make fun of Chekhov for being, uh, you know, got him sad, you know, and uh, the Russian joke and screaming, and that was it for so long. So he was really thrilled for Bester to come along and really get to, you know, chew into something and and show his stuff. Uh, yeah. In a sustained way, and have a character, have a dark character as opposed to check off sweetness and call me light and all that, you know. And of course, the great uh, <laughs> Andreas uh, Katsoulis. Yeah. Yes. 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 Which I, I was no, he had to be. He had to have been Tomalock before. Yeah. Obviously. I was going to say he was Tomalock before, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah. He was Tomalock before he was the one armed man in Fugitive, I think. Which is Mike no. Tomalock was Mike Tomalock was a Romulan. That's why he was cool. <laughs> Now, it's my understanding too. I know that we're starting off uh, we're starting off the show with some bad news. Of course, we we've, we've already acknowledged the uh, death of Harold Ramis, but we also need to acknowledge the death of Cliff Bold. I <clears throat> I was thinking that. And uh, not as not as highbrow a high profile a person, but uh, the uh, one of the longtime prop masters on Next Gen, Joe Longo died in the last month and I went to Really? Him. Yeah. Oh, what a shame. I did not he know wasn't, that. Yeah, he was like 74. He wasn't that um that old, and I guess the it was two or three weeks before it came out and was public, and they had a public service for him. But um, oh. just a small, it was just a small kind of gathering. But I I blogged about that, and I was going to put something up about um, Cliff Bowl too, because I had yeah. known back in the day had known Cliff pretty well and took some stuff. Well, we're very house. very sorry for your yeah. loss and everybody who knew him. And I mean, he's he's the director who's responsible for some of my favorite and a lot of people's favorite TNG episodes. Mm-hmm. And so why don't we talk a little bit about his influence on the show and what you as a person, as somebody who knew him, what do you think his best, what was his real and best influence on, on Star Trek? Well, I mean, I, let me, I, I didn't know Cliff real, real well. I, I talked mm-hmm. to him an awful lot when the shows were going, but mm-hmm. when I was working on The Companion. And of course, um, like, okay, best of both worlds, one and two, which... It's kind of interesting now looking back, but when they're in the middle of it, you know, that was the first cliffhanger they did, the first two-parter they did. And it started off, the practice was to have the same person direct both episodes. And after a while, after a while in some of the other series, they got away from that. They had different – like he did – he also directed Unification 2, but not Unification 1. Interesting. And Unification 2 was uh, the one with – the one with Leonard. So he directed, you know, Leonard Nimoy in that. So, you know, and here's the thing. In TV, remember, it's not like a movie. The directors are like the guys who are the oddballs, unless they're a regular director. You know, I mean, right. the writers and the cast and producers are the ones. who And the director kind of comes in and just, you know, the, their main job is to get it done on time, get everybody out the door without too much overtime, and don't, no, don't screw anything up. 
<laughs> as opposed to like the director who directed the first Frankie show. But <laughs> <laughs> most of the time, if you're a competent director, it's supposed to be a you know a no no brain thing. Although there's a lot of sometimes if you're not used to you know, like working with you know visual effects and blue or green screen or whatever that that can kind of throw you if you're not experienced that way. But Cliff was really good about getting a lot of bang for the buck. And when they did Best of Both Worlds, they didn't exactly have the biggest you know, Borg sets and things. So for the, the parts of the shows that were set on the cube, getting all that tension and drama out of it, you know, without a whole lot to play with at times, um, you know, they did. And uh, he, I was just reading an old interview here where he was talking about at the end of part one, uh, they were talking about, and Mike Westmore's told this story about like getting the, getting the red laser on the, on Locutus at the end was a total a total impromptu thing between Cliff Bowl and Mike Westmore. Oh, interesting. Were, yeah, and they were talking about something to jazz up the last shot, and Mike Westmore and his son Junior had Mike Westmore Junior had is the one that like, eventually did all the electronics for Data. You know when they would rip his head open and and the famous thing in First Contact where all the Borg blink Morse code messages of you know people's right. phone numbers and stuff and goofy things. But on this one, he you know it's just something as simple as you know he says we have this laser. What if we used a laser? And, and that would Michael Mike Westmore says why don't we use a laser? And Cliff is the one that said oh yeah let's strap it right on his head and when he looks in the camera. It comes right at you, and it'll be cool. So that iconic, huh. um, the iconic Locutus of Borg, you know, moment. Uh, you, that's if nothing else, that's Cliff Bowles right there. So sometimes cool. TV directors get to have a real mark, and or sometimes they just come in and you know connect the dots. And uh, and he said later, and on. and that became that, such yeah. a signature thing for the Borg too. I mean, even in First Contact, in the movie, the lasers were such an iconic. Oh yeah. Uh, Oh, that scene the where they come out of the shadows, like yeah, in the say, fog. It's like I'll yeah. see you one locutus and raise you five. Right. <laughs> that's on my Borg 4D T-shirt from Star Trek: The Experience. That's the image. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I know he he was such an influential. I mean, an influential director to me, just because he 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 directed so many of the episodes that I really really loved the most, and so I know. That he's going to yeah. be sorely, sorely but missed. He's not like it's a, you know he's not like he. But here's the thing, just as a per, and I hadn't talked to him in a long time. But the, when the shows were running, and I did my first big, huge sit down interview to cut to catch up, and then I would every couple of years that we'd sit down and do a like the kind of thing I put on my Trekland on CDs, uh, Trekland on CDs, speaker CDs. Um, maybe I should do him coming up here in a year or two, but. Uh, we do the catch ups and uh he was the thing it came so he was just like he was just working collar blue um working collar blue collar working director guy right. very humble knowing <laughs> that in the business and tv you know directors can be you you screw up and your name's mud and no one will hire you. i mean you know it's like you got to keep yeah. your nose clean there's no such thing as oh i mean the idea that we sit around and go and he directed best of both worlds and he right. directed you you know he also directed aquiel and he directed i mean you right. know it's kind of like <laughs> they stick you in a slot and sometimes if you have some clout or they pick you like to do a finale or to do a pilot or something or the big show the big rating sweep show that's cool and you're if you're known that well, if you're you know, but sometimes you just take the slot that you're given and you don't know what the show is until two or three weeks ahead. And they say, here's your script. You got this one. And you're like, oh, OK. And you go to the production meetings and you plan your shots. And, you know, and then if you're over time, everybody yells at you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's it's a it's a mixed bag. But the idea that he he said later on that, you know, his truck and he did a ton of he did MacGyver's. He did a ton of shows. Right. Uh, in the 70s and 80s and 90s, but but it was the Star Treks, you know, that, that he, I mean, it's like anybody else that's touched by Star Trek. That's what they'll be known for, you know. <laughs> it's a good point. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I was a guest star for two days. You I won got... an Academy Award? Who cares? You won Star Trek. Yep, yeah. Right. I was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's he's the same way, so, yeah. Um, but he was, I just, he was very plain spoken, you know. He'd say, oh, yeah, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing, so I, I don't remember, you know. <laughs> And um, that, and I remember when we went out the, the very the first time I talked to him, uh, we went out to his house in the valley, which was really weird because I remember coming up over the 405, and I was like, "Oh, this is because I'd been in Glendale and Burbank on these first trips out. This is mm -hmm. like the second year I came out from Oklahoma to to be in LA to interview for the book before we moved here full time, and uh, my whole thing had been, and if you don't know, like Burbank and Glendale and Pasadena are kind of off to the Northeast of Hollywood proper, and you come around Griffith Park 
you know, to right. get into Hollywood. And and I had never been up in the valley proper, and I just remember going up to his house and going, oh, well, this is – I've never been over here. And I remember going up the 405 Sepulveda Pass Hill and coming down, and I was like – Oh, so this is the valley because it's like <laughs> take out their flat and squares in front of you. And I went to his house. It was like the first time I ever was in the valley was to go to Cliff Bowles' house. It hit me the other day when I was thinking about all this stuff. It oh, was like, how funny. This is funny. And, you know, at his house. And your first impression of the valley is, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Urban, and it was like, okay. And, but I mean, I got to his house and he had a, he collected, he wasn't a Jay Leno or anything, but he collected, he, he tried to one at a time have a car. Yeah. And he had it when I was there. He had a 41 Mercury sedan with you know, woody sides on it, and he was showing it off to me. We went out in the garage afterwards. I've got pictures like that. So I, it was just, it was just weird. And then I just felt bad that I hadn't, you know, the last 10, 15 years hadn't stayed more in touch with him. Um, but you know, he's got this. He, it, it's great that he did all this work in TV and all this creative work and started off. He started off like crashing gates and getting in and starting off as like a. A script boy and, and a copy editor and stuff, and then worked his way into the guilds and, and directing. But you gotta uh, anyway. love a Hollywood story like that. You yeah. really do, because that just never happens anymore. <laughs> and you know, outside of our realm, the the bigger wide world isn't going to know Cliff Bowl unless somehow in thirty years people start worshiping the Bolians or something. But you know, I do. That's just me. <laughs> and you know why the Bolians got named for him? Do you? Why? No. He was, I think his, it was, if it wasn't his first show, it was, it was his second. But anyway, he was, he was down to direct a Conspiracy, right? Into first season. The writing is starting to pick up. It's the one with the little wormy guys and Riker. Uh, yeah, yeah, disgusting. I love this. Spike yeah. thing, yeah. And the famous exploding head at the end that they, yeah. they had enough kids, parents write in that they slapped down visual effects and wouldn't let them get gory like that for years and years and years. But... <laughs> Um, the original script, when Picard beams down to meet the three captains, surreptitiously, totally, you know, covertly off the record. On that asteroid. On that asteroid, on the yeah. Thing. On the mining. Right. Guys, like, oh, beat. yeah. Uh, um, and they're like standing on a gangway or something. It's kind of wacky looking. Uh, the, there were, there's a, um, there's the, the captain that says her, she was, she's like 33 and I immediately went, oh, oh it's a woman captain who's beaten James T. Kirk's. I'm the youngest captain in history record. Right. But there was a – you saw the first Bolian, Captain Reeks, I think. And that was originally supposed to be an Andorian. Oh. Oh. And they got into it, and Rick Berman decided that the new show should not have – you know, they were already into the whole thing about let's not do Vulcans, Klingons, Romulans because that's original series and we're trying to be our own series and blah, blah, blah. But on top of that, Rick decided that he did not <laughs> – he did not like um, – he didn't think any aliens in Star Trek should have antennas because that was like bug-eyed, monstery, 50s sci-fi-ish. So they basically – the Bolians were totally created because as like replacement Andorians. Which is, they just needed a blue alien. Yeah, it's just like take the wig and the antennas <laughs> off and uh, – you know. So instead of that, they made them bald and, and they made them with those long earlobes. And then later on, their face. Yeah, yeah. So at the last second, they were like – Okay, well, we can't call them Andorians. What do we call them? And somebody jokingly said, let's call them Bolians. And they went, okay. And oh, I love it. I love it. Cliff Bolt. Very yeah, cool. I was very, very sad cool. to hear he'd passed. Well, and well I'm, speak, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, well, no. Speaking of uh, Next Generation oh. being compared to, uh, to, to the original series, I have a question for you, Dr. McCoy. <laughs> <laughs> So how was it that you evaded Lolani's charms? Well, <laughs> I'm a doctor, not a Lothario. Oh! Um, well, you know, doctors, I mean, they always, I hate to say this, but the reason doctors know they have to keep on, you know, like they have to still be standing when everybody else is falling apart, right? Yeah. So um, the lone exception being deadly ears. So uh, McCoy like doesn't take chances. He 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 saw green and immediately loaded up on all the anti Orion pheromone meds he could you know good drugs he could get a hold of. So <laughs> <laughs> I mean there was really? a reason that's what, he that, called that's what you're going with. That's what you're going to go with. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense to me. <laughs> makes me feel good. 
For those of you who are listening who may not understand, Larry is talking about his role in Star Trek Continues and uh, the, the the second episode, correct? Yes. 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 Lani, yeah. And I know I'm just, I'm very excited. So tell us <clears throat> how Star Trek Continues going, Mr. Larry. <laughs> well, it's going right along. They're going to shoot the third show uh, in March. Fantastic. And middle of March, and I'm going to go out and watch some of it. Now, I, I kind of made this announcement in January with everything going on and like things like Con of Wrath not getting worked on at all last year and all. As much as it uh, it killed me, and it also killed me for the part because I wanted to do some more acting um, boning up, and I wasn't able to do that either. So anyway, I'm, I'm going to step back and not play McCoy, but stay involved as a creative producer with the show, and, and maybe in a year or two circle back and do some – camera work and not not that I'm going to not do you know if somebody else walked up to me and threw something in my lap not that I wouldn't do it but I'm really going to focus this this next 12 18 months on on some new things and um one of them being uh working uh, working on a career in voiceover actually and commercial and you know narration and animation and all that all and working on Wonderful. a demo and I've been doing that the last couple of uh, last year or so, and that was t- in a in a really good program that I'm in with kind of a mentor uh, woman Tish Hicks who's got a great program and not just teaching and mentoring but um, socializing and network too. It's the whole shebang. And um, anyway, and that had even like was taking hits from. I mean, it's like it's like last year was like the headline year because I had stellar cartography come out and yeah, and, and mm-hmm. Star Trek continues hit me the month we were gonna have this really tight three months time frame on Star Cartography, and then the continues came along right in the middle of starting that. I'm like, no, what? It's like rains and pours. Jesus Christ, can we like spread this <laughs> spread this out a little bit? So all the cool stuff that happened last year, kind of like after a couple of quiet years, was great. It's just like, it's kind of like it's about to monsoon in Southern California. We have this drought, but do we have to have like, you know, I don't need five monsoons in a row because we, you know, we'd be bombarded by everybody sliding down from the tops of the mountain. So really, it snowed here again today. So I really don't want to hear. <laughs> Damn drought in California. Well, yeah. send it can yeah, box is up in mail. But no, I well, mean, so it's so that's part of it. But I'm gonna, but I'm very much involved. And and um, actually, here's something for everybody, just a shout out. If uh, there's a group that started this on our behalf, but. For twenty, you know, the, there's the two big science fiction awards are the Hugos and the Nebulas, and um, right, Ralph. And the Hugos are voted on by Worldcon attendees every year, and they're primarily for literature and you know and artwork and printed stuff. But they did years and years ago come up with uh, there's a Hugo for dramatic presentation, and I guess a few years ago they split it into long and short form. And you know, sitting on the edge of forever won a Hugo, and Menagerie won a Hugo. Um, and a lot of, you know, full length movies. So right. there's been a move, uh, and about 10 years ago, I think the next gen, the, um, Star Trek phase two episode that Mark Zakree did with George Takei got nominated, didn't win, but it was nominated for a Hugo. So uh, there's been a movement out to nominate, uh, Pilgrim of Eternity since it was in 2013. Since it was debuted in 2013, it qualifies more than qualifies as a short form dramatic presentation for the Hugo. So if there's any uh, Worldcon attendees out there, either from last year, 2013, this year, or for next year, 2015 already, uh, you're entitled to vote for all the Hugos. And if you would, please, for, you know, as they do with the Academy voting, for your consideration. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're allowed to vote for uh, – the how it is is everybody votes, and the top five vote-getters are then the finalists, and then only the people at that year's Worldcon vote. So you come in with five finalists. So anybody with the, the sound of our subspace radio here, um, if you would be so kind, if you hadn't seen Star Trek Continue, if you're a, again, Worldcon attendee or supporter from um, 2013, 14, or 15, you're entitled to vote for nominees. And the top five overall in every category are the finalists. So if you could that's see your way clear to putting in a vote for us, yeah, so that's how – that's how that works, and um, you know, vote for everything else you want to, of course. And but we're the short form; the full-length movies are long form. So I think it's ninety minutes is the dividing line. So, so and there's a little luck. shout out for that. Our uh, our last regular weekly episode, we were talking, and you know, Star Trek Continues had something happen that we were like, it's quite the achievement. And I'm not—I don't mean this sarcastically. You guys actually made the National Enquirer. 
<laughs> yeah, that was. But that's, that's kind of you know, fun. that's. <clears throat> that's a huge audience that reads that. Oh yeah, know, whatever we think about it. So that's pretty cool that you guys got some kind of you know some kind of mainstream acknowledgement going on because then I saw TMZ and some other things mm-hmm. picked up on that. The old domino thick. And here's what's amazing. Tom Hanks. It was. Oh well, that was before the. That was. Yeah, before. that was before. That, that was uh, yeah. based on the first one. The first episode. Yeah. Which was phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. That little just aside, he was just in that little informal. In what's his name show and sitting there with his water bottle and goes, oh, have you seen these guys doing the Star Trek? That's amazing. The stuff they're doing is amazing. But um, I was just saying, was... the amazing thing about the National Enquirer, real quick, is, is that it wasn't even there wasn't even a scandal. It was just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it was, that's what I was laughing about. It wasn't even a scandal. It wasn't like a big thing. It was actually a really nice, yeah, you know, fluff piece. It was wonderful. And, yeah, and it, was, and it like, was true. It wasn't even. <laughs> There wasn't anything lying about it. It was great. Oh, there was no scandal. I wasn't there to meet Michelle, so, uh, you know. But, uh, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah. you will be missed as McCoy. I, I will say seeing you in, in the show has been fantastic. I think you've done a great job. And uh, personally, I will miss you on oh. seeing, seeing you as McCoy. Thank you, no, guys. I was going to say, are they re- I, so I'm assuming they're recasting the role. Well, it's I've, it's been kind of an oddball thing. I was actually offered it because the original McCoy, Chuck Huber, couldn't make the first shoot when they had to rejigger the shoot. So, oh, and then oh, I yeah, did. Oh yeah, I remember that. Shoot. Okay, yeah, yeah. So if you see the vignettes, it's um, and I I actually sent him did I, I don't say I did a lot of coaching, but I sent him some McCoy what I thought were important McCoy things and and all that. So yeah, he's shooting. Um, you know, the difference between the first one, the first. Um, Pilgrim of Eternity, and then Lolani was, you know, people that were saying, oh, don't do a sequel every time. Well, it wasn't a sequel. Lolani wasn't. And it was a really different dynamic show. For one thing, it was very ca- uh, guest cast centric, you know, and a lot of people were saying, well, the regulars didn't get much to do. Well, that's the way the regular run of the sh- the, the episodes show, were, you know. Right. So there wasn't a whole lot of of uh, Scotty McCoy, Uhura, Sulu, Chekhov in the second one. You know, it was mainly Kirk and, and then... Um, Spock and our McKenna character, but then there's like four guest stars that have, you know, roles. So anyway, that's, you know, that's, that's the balance that'll happen as it goes forward. And, um, and the next one is, uh, I'll, is, is a, well, it's a quasi sequel. I'll just say that. <laughs> well, with all due respect to, to, of course, the lovely Vina and then the, the lovely lady, and Eve, uh, uh, what's her name? Yvette, uh, oh, what was it? The, with Garth of Izar, uh, Ivan De Carlo, and of course oh. the, the the three lovely ladies from Enterprise, yep. Lolani maybe. Woo. Oh, Fiona, yeah, <laughs> yeah, she was great. And yeah, oh, and here's the thing. Here's the thing for that. She only got that. Talk about me and my three weeks at the beginning. She only got that role on a week's notice because our original, um, the original girl. I should say that. Yeah, the original woman down to play. Um, Lalani, uh, her, she, her real life. She had a recurring role in a show uh, in England, and they called her up on a week's notice. Like oh. in, in the states, you couldn't do that, but they did it in England. It was you know it was paid and all that. But she was really looking forward to doing this. And they, uh, Vic went through his you know like Rolodex and memory and the little brain trust, and they and they somebody knew uh, 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 Fiona and. Uh, grabbed her and she did that on a week's notice i mean it was amazing and it's a wow. huge chunk of lines and you know and seeing she had a great a great sense of vulnerability that's what came mm-hmm. through to me so much was that and if, you know i'm not gonna lie at first i thought somehow you guys had gotten katie perry i i totally <laughs> mean that because she looked so much like her you know what i mean she i was like eyes. how did they keep this quiet that they got katie perry <laughs> to do star trek continues <laughs> In Southeast Georgia. Well, you know, I didn't even, th- you know, I'm there. I didn't even think about it. Uh, and I saw people start to mention that after, you know, after it was up. And and I saw like every fifth person was like, wow, she looks just like Katy Perry. And I'm like, oh, she does. Because, <laughs> yeah, I, I, the, the big thing being there was this was a very segmented shoot. So it was like, you know, Grant was in at the beginning and the, Lou was at the two days near the end, and F- poor Fiona was there. All, it was like one day she had a break from the green paint, and they evolved the green paint after the first day and went with uh, – I've got a picture of Tim Vitito, our makeup guy, standing out back on the phone ordering like 
He's like, well, how many gallons can you send me? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I remember it was like, okay, the first plan is not enough, and it's rubbing off too easy, and we're just I was going to say, that's, them, that's the know. biggest problem, isn't it? That's that some of that stuff, it just rubs off. Yeah. yeah, and it's the same way, if it, like if you're doing Andorians, or if, you're, you know, if you want a solid color. But uh, the, the odd thing about the way that turned out was some people said, oh, my God, you, you, the, there's a horrible scene here where the green is coming off. Did anybody catch that? Well, they're like bruises. I mean, that was one thing. It's like, how do you make that read? You know, how do you, they, you oh. know, the bruise? What does is, what is green skin look like when it gets, you know, what color is their blood and what color would it bruise to? And so there's like these brownish, bluish brown splotches on her neck and. Anyway, it, there was a couple of times people and we say, "Oh, that's a bruise." Oh, okay, because he's you know she's she was beat up and well yeah, yeah. that's about interesting. 10, about ten days ago, I met the uh, the, the crew from uh, Farragut. They were at the Farpoint convention where I was at, so that was a lot of fun to talk to them. Oh, knew, good, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they're uh, and uh, John and Michael, I think, are are they're really in the D.C. area. They're not from down right now, so it makes it easy for them. Yeah. Oh, one of these days I'm going to get to Farpoint or um, oh, Farpoint uh, Shirley's. Or, yeah. yeah, Shirley's yeah. been blocked because of the the tour and the way the summer cons are all bumping each other on dates, and it's gotten insane. And I can't. Oh, you don't even know. I can't go to Shirley uh, this year. Yeah, you can't. Terry, you know that. Well, Shirley, and it's the same weekend as Vegas. Vegas. Oh, it's the same. I thought it was the weekend before. No, it is the same weekend. Same no, Comic Con. Yeah, Comic-Con the same. Is the weekend before. Yeah, the That's weekend it. before Vegas is now Comic Con. Oh, what a nightmare! <laughs> Rawr. Yeah. Well, we had mentioned earlier um, stellar cartography. Yes. I have to say, I love what you did with that. In fact, I get my uh, my frames th- uh, next week. <laughs> did you hawk your house just to buy frames to put all your maps? Oh, they're huge. <laughs> <laughs> the good but news I got is I now have frames. The bad news is I have no walls to put them on. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I'm gonna hang up uh, two of them. So yeah, I, I can't wait. Which which, which who are you gonna? Yeah, I think I'm gonna go with the 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 Alpha and the Beta Quadrant. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. For Very, the, for those of you who are listening, Larry is the is <laughs> is one of the how should I say? He's the author of the narrative book of and mm-hmm. and also a contributor to the Star Trek Stellar Cartography. Starfleet reference library that was released at the end of last year. And it, it, it takes what we all kind of knew from the star charts from long ago and pretty much puts it all on steroids. It's gorgeous. Awesome. It's, wow, it's, it's, it's awesome. gorgeous. You calling, you calling 2003 long ago, Terry? Yeah, actually I am. That was 11 <laughs> years, honey. <laughs> I know. It's really kind of like, <laughs> I mean, I think of like the first map, book in 1980 is like long ago but I'm... Yeah, well that too. Well, I... Yeah, that's ancient day. These are the old ones. But yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I would say to me, you know, the, the star charts were the first book I ever really got because when I started to play in, in writing fan fiction and stuff it was the first book I bought because I wanted to at least I wanted my fan fiction to pass fan scrutiny. Yeah. Fan Which must. meant you have, and you know how fans are. <laughs> no, how are they, Aunt Terry? They will, t- they'll rip you a new Aunt one. Aunt Terry. <laughs> <laughs> they'll rip you a new one. So if you don't sound like, you know, you've got your characters going from one planet to the next and how long that might be and where that is in the quadrant. And you, that you means you're right for bad robot. Oh. Oh. Yes. So uh, I'm very <laughs> pleased to see the, 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 uh, <laughs> That good <laughs> maps updated. They're beautiful and they're stunning. Every the print quality of everything is stunning. So yeah, people yeah. can still purchase it, correct? At their favorite. Oh yeah, yeah. This was Amazon. not like a Christmas dream that went away or anything. Yeah, I, <laughs> no, I mean I want to make sure that <laughs> you know much. it's still available that people yep. can purchase it on Amazon, and they'd be wise if they went to the GNT show first, uh, GNTshow dot com, and then clicked on the Amazon link on our website, and then that way. We we will get just a smidge, a tiny little bit of support when you uh, and everybody buy that does that gets a free insult hurled at Bob or C by me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, aside from the fact that they could do the same thing if they came to LarryNimageShot dot com. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, fair enough. 
you might want to you you know the the only thing goofy about about um, my impression after having one good long like three hour interview with Bob Orsi is that he's the member of the Supreme Court of Bad Robot that you might like want not to hurl insults at. But anyway, <laughs> we'll, see, well, I'm really curious to see what this third script turns up with a different director. It's going to be kind of interesting. I'm a paratrooper. I live on the edge. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't get hung up in the tree on the way down. That's all I can say. I think all of us... Go ahead. Yeah, Lindelhoff's too easy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, he's you know it's just it's it's just so weird. Isn't the whole vibe with the with the movie Empire now so different than it was? I mean, it's like the first time yeah. everything was all frothy and it, like oh oh seven oh eight. It was just you couldn't you everything was so thick you couldn't cut it with a knife. And then it was like even before In a Darkness came, even before Stid came out, <laughs> people were like bored. Like no one, you know, people were like, "Oh yeah, we're supposed to be excited and all wondering about this next movie." Yeah, okay. And then it was kind of like, "Oh, I hated the first one, love the second one." No, I love the first one, hate the second one. Well, I love both of them. Well, I hated both of them. Okay, is there a fifth way? I mean, it was just, you know. And now it's kind of like, "Oh, are they doing another one?" Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm simplifying too much. I've been in my, I've been in my cavern the last four or five, six months here. So the con season just starting no, up. No, so. the one thing that gets to me is people are like, "Oh, you don't <laughs> like the new ones because you're an old school fan." No, I I like them as popcorn movies. What I don't like <laughs> is just it, it. It's they're good action fun movies, but they're not Trek. And anybody that says, "Oh, well, it's a new style of Star Trek," well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that does not excuse plot holes that I could drive the freaking Millennium Falcon through. I'm a just Vox Vengeance, City ship. The USS Vengeance through. You so know? you're saying, hey. on one hand, you have Star Trek with a motions chip, and on the other hand, you have Star Trek without a motions chip. Oh, <laughs> nicely done. Very good, Larry. Very good. <laughs> That's just a, yeah, just hit me. And... and <laughs> And Very things nice. that don't make sense are, okay, so Nero, when he arrived, that changed the timeline. Okay, cool. Well, Scotty was already a hot shit engineer before that should have happened. So how does he wind up with uh, an Oompa Loompa on a, this ice planet <laughs> when that shouldn't have been changed at all? You, you're going to have to – I can hear your esophagus getting all knotted up already, Nick. You're just going to have to take a breath and – yeah. <laughs> Oops, you really want? <laughs> See, that's Orsi calling me. <laughs> he's, he's calling you. He knows. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, KO I on line that one. Me. KO on line one. Um, yeah, really. Larry, yeah. um, I have a, a, a question. Are we hop, you, skipping, and jumping around enough for you guys? Because I want to make sure and <laughs> remind everybody that it's, it's also Star Trek tour season again, too. So before we get to the start. Do you want to talk about that first, or do you want to talk about uh, uh, your... Tr- Trekland trunk. Oh, let's or, do the tour for it because the trunk is tour. merrily rusting along on its hinges and <laughs> it's doing fine. <laughs> Yay okay. for tour! What's going on this year, Larry? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked, kitties. No, um, <laughs> we we uh, Terrace Cassidy and I are doing the it's his company uh, Geek Nation tours and um, whom we love and we try this be next to at the Star Trek convention every yes, year. Yes, you guys are just We're really good, people. cozy neighbors. <laughs> Actually, he's he's doing great. He keeps adding. You know, he does other things. This Trek tour is just one, and he has twenty or thirty tours, and they're that's growing like leaps and bounds. He's he's going to add some kid tours or family tours, and he's actually going. This is what's so hysterical to me. It's come full circle from the days when local news would come out to the local con and find the googiest, you know, worst makeup, buck toothed half naked ugly boy fan yes. boy to put on TV on Sunday night when they wouldn't even help get people in the door but the fat boy painted belly guys out at 20 below at the end zone at the football game were fair game and I'm a football fan I'm not I'm not jumping fast. right right, right. You know, that was all right. There. and one of the best things of the geek revolution you know of the big bang era here has right. been that everything is it's like oh everything is kind of like you can be passionate about this. You can be. You can geek out about this and geek out. Well, what's funny is Terrace's company now, his Geek Nation tours. He says, "I think I'm going to start adding some sports tours." So it's like it's come back full circle. <laughs> you know, whatever. That's I don't, I don't it, it, it's, like, it fits in. They yeah. really have to geek sports and like go to uh, 
you know, curling, curling. matches curling, or yes, something or whatever, or you know, oh, rugby. let's do it. But um, but anyway, but no, he's he. You know, they go to gaming conventions, they go to Gen Con, he goes to medieval castles, and they've gone to. He's done Civil War battlefield uh, tours with you know Gettysburg was haha uh, was was last year's 150th anniversary right. or 100th anniversary. Oh, no, yeah. we already gave him grief for that, right? He, right. he got an earful at Vegas from me about being you know 20 minutes away and not letting me know. <laughs> <laughs> By the way. Nick, I've always wanted to ask you something. It just occurred to me today that I'd never thought to ask you this. So what happened to Gettysburg's 1 through 6? Gettysburg 7 is my call sign in the Army for the radio because I'm the senior enlisted person in my unit. The commander is always the number 6. So if if my commander is Gettysburg 6, and because I'm the non-commissioned officer in charge, I'm Gettysburg 7. I I, I know. I was just trying to go all clone. Oh, I did not know that. See, now, but (laughs) I learned something new. Oh, okay. Thank you, Larry. Okay. I, I was after, just trying after to go, the years you know, I've been working with Nick, I never knew that. Or Reina, or Wayun on you there with the clone numbering system. No, no. It, <laughs> okay, Larry, they can't hear me now because I've silenced them. One mm-hmm. through six have all had temporal displacements or other things happen to them. Gotcha. Okay. One, of, one of them is still strapped to the, uh, the General Meade statue at Gettysburg. <laughs> so, but we don't talk about that. Okay. So yes, so it's my radio call sign in the. Office. I got you. I got you. I'll take it to my uh, Android grave. I'll never divulge your. <laughs> well, well your back seat. to Geek Nation tours. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so of all of that that's booming along, we skipped a year last year, and we're offering the L.A. to Vegas start. Er, I love saying this because my name is in the title officially, but uh, our, our Star Trek film sites tour. Which the little quickie handle we came up with was L.A. to Vegas because it's the week before the Vegas convention, and you come to L.A. and you know we have a week's worth of touring around here at at all Trek sites, but they um, overlap. Most of them overlap as cool tourist sites, so you can go home and show your pictures to unaware mundanes in your circle, and no one will know the why. They would never know, right? They never, they will never know. But but <laughs> we have tweaked it for the second time, and the biggest thing we're going to do this time is come to Vegas today early. Go on past Vegas up I-15 over to the Valley of Fire and go through, you know, the Kirk, the uh, Kirk Death Zone from Generations ah. where they filmed. And, Very cool. and yes, it will be August, and yes, it will be, uh, you know, steamy, but um, or not steamy since we'll be in a desert. But uh, yeah, and and work permitting, Mike Westmore is going to go uh, go out with us since he was in the very small team that actually shot out there uh, for Generations. And, uh, yeah, and here's a piece of trivia. The real bridge, the infamous bridge that killed Kirk, not the main bridge, but the secondary bridge, ha uh-huh. um, <laughs> ha. The, the movie company, come on, Dare, you're just, you're I'm just still not I'm quite a oh, oh, yet. Just, uh, yep. No, they, the movie company donated the bridge, it turns out, to the park, and they actually are using it over like a little what passes for a desert stream or a gully or something somewhere, and people take pictures on it all the time. You know. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's really cool. That's really oh. cool. <laughs> so, uh, so that's our that's the new big thing. But and the other, our welcome dinner this year is going to be at uh, Xerox Restaurant. Xerox oh, La- I want to go! I want to go! I want to go! So, and the rest is uh, if people, so you know, fun. if you go to the Facebook page for for Geek Nation tours and go back to 2012 and find the um, the Star Trek tour albums, uh, there's a ton of photos in there. You you get a good uh, you know. Q Continuum and uh, Santa Monica Pier and Will Rogers for the landing spot of the Bird of Prey in Star Trek IV and um, Bronson Canyon, Canyon 019 Planets and um, <laughs> <laughs> and Vasquez Rocks with uh, – with, um, oh, jeez, I've gone blank. Uh, with Bobby? Bobby, yes, Bobby Clark. Yeah. Oh, my God. I kept wanting That's to right. call him Danny something. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Bobby Clark walks you through how they shot Arena for the two days he was out there in the Gorn suit. And uh, so, is he also going to bring any of his hockey sticks from the '73, '74 no. Stanley Cup? No. Wrong. Yeah. Oh, that's wrong. No, he's Clark. been banned yes. from. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no smart ass. <he's> <laughs> <laughs> Because that Bobby Clark lives a little further away than uh, Agua Dulce. So, uh, <laughs> now, um, the, how many days is the tour? Does the tour last before you even start to head to Las Vegas? You you come into L.A. on Saturday, 
and we start that afternoon. We go to Griffith Observatory, and we go to Ciroc's restaurant, and then Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, um, Tuesday night, we hit Vegas. We're in L.A. all the time, and then it's the you know three hours over, although we do a couple things on the way. And then Wednesday, we are going to go out to Valley of Fire, come back Wednesday night, and then the con starts on Thursday. On Thursday. And, and then great. And the Terrace hangs when? on. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm leading it. We have clips in the van, the bus, the whole thing. But when we actually get to Vegas for Rio for the con to start, Terrace is still there as your concierge. So if you want to escape the Rio and want to uh, go downtown or go to the Strip or whatever, you know, he'll do the regular tour concierge thing. We'll have a goodbye dinner before everybody gets away Sunday night or Monday, and. Um, and all that. So, you know, it's like if it's the old thing of if you're – I don't know how many foreign listeners you guys might have beyond our shores, but um, if you've never traveled – or if you're American and you've never traveled big time, you've never gone to Vegas or gone to L.A. and it's intimidating, you know, it's a good way to, to double it up. You can do your Star Trek thing and, and do some real traveling. And um, mm, We know some people from Australia that haven't booked their flights yet. <laughs> yeah, we have listeners all over the world, and uh, uh, we are looking forward to meeting several of them this year. Mm. And, and what day are you going to the Bunny Ranch this year? <laughs> oh, no, that's the yeah. day after. That's the oh, after. okay. <laughs> that's, that's the dilithium package. That's the. <laughs> I got your crystals right here, Captain. That's the. That's the fine print. That's the very that's the really fine print, if you know what I'm saying. And, no, and if, and if anybody's that's listening... That's fine. That's what it is. And if anybody's listening and, and is interested in it, I will tell you that... Okay, Larry's a good guy, and so is Terrace. But if you... Ciroc, if just for that alone, he is such an amazing... Talking to him last year at the convention, wow, what an amazing... Person, he's he grew up in front of our eyes. If you grew up watching, you know, watching him on Deep Space Nine, and what a, a pure gentleman and great person he is. Oh, he is. And what's funny is, I think a couple years ago, I was where my table was at Vegas. Uh, Sunday afternoon, I was pa- everybody was packing up. It was like late in the afternoon, and I looked up, and uh, I think all that weekend, um, um, Jesus, I'm getting old. Uh, Nog. Aaron. Aaron, Aaron, yes, Jesus. Aaron. Oh, yes. Who, who uh, I, I proudly, I and Terry can, and Mike can verify that I can actually call a personal friend, which is one of the coolest things in my life. Yeah, that's awesome. That is. But I, all I said was, I looked up and I just looked across, and the, and it's like they hadn't the whole weekend they hadn't crossed paths, and they were just sitting over there, just leaning on a on a empty table, just you know shooting the breeze, talking. Nobody around, the two of them talking, and it looked and it was. It was very cool because I don't usually look at things like this, but it was like watching a nog and and um, and Jake scene Jake. on the station. Only they're work, they're leaning on a table in a convention center in Civilian Earth Club. Anyway, it was just kind of cool, and I was like, "Oh, camera, stupid camera!" And I, I like, and they're just sitting there, just like talking, like their arms crossed and laughing. And I got two or three shots off, and by the time that happened, and people like saw me with the camera and followed my camera over, and then within yeah. like ten or fifteen seconds, and, and not that it was a horrible thing, but like within right. that, then suddenly there were five or six people walking up, you know, and they were. It wasn't a big deal. It wasn't like nine thousand people descended on the you know locusts or something, but. Um, it, but it, just for a second, it was like just a little quiet. But it was funny how it was cool to see them talk, and at the same time, it was also an echo of of a of a Jake Nog scene. It was just kind of, you know. But they hadn't talked all weekend; they were just having a moment, and uh, and then they turned around and posed for me. And I'm like, no, I liked it when you were just talking. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's just really scary to have little moment memories like that. But uh, yeah. But and I was the cool I was thing about Vegas. Of, you have a million of those now. Yeah, yeah, I was jealous of you last year because you were the, where you were sitting, uh, meeting um, Admiral Nagura, not Nagura, um, Nechayev last year. Oh, what a okay. wonderful lady! My God, she was amazing, and she so she she's so funny because we were talking about the novels, and she said, "I have a question." I said, what? She said, am I as big a bitch in the novels as I was on the show? <laughs> <laughs> She's really funny because in the weird time, like when the communicator was still going, just like 10 years ago, and they first tried to do license conventions, and they tried to tie the Enterprise actors into that, and all the stuff about photos changed, and you had to get licensed photos, and the actors had to have licensed photos. And there was a time when before you know, frame grabbing and everybody could do a digital everything in their laptop um, – 
some of the actors went out and paid big money to fans or collectors who happened to have you know a clip where they could do frame grabbing, and they would pay them money to do, to do originals so they could have signing photos. And then, and she was one who you know she was trying to do it by the book, and she was like, "Can you?" She knew that I worked in the archives for you know like communicator and fact files and stuff, and she's like, "Can you help me find a?" Because if you were too big originally, before even creation had the had the license, if you were if it was a hassle to find you, nobody wanted to like mess with it. And if somebody walked in the door with your frame, it's like, okay, we can do this. But it was there was a weird time. There was a like a weird five or six, eight, nine months where there was this black hole of weirdness, and some of the actors were, or they had gone and paid money to have stuff done, and then instantly were told they couldn't sell them because they weren't the you know the chipped and branded thing. But then they were guest stars who it was too hard to track them down. It was just strange. But she had the poor case of. Every day Nicheyev shot, it was always in the ready room or, you know, on DS9. It was just an odd – I mean, there was never – she never worked on a day where the set photographer was on. So she was in six or eight shows, and there was oh, no wow. set photography of her at all. So the only way she had ever had anything to, to have for signing for fans was to go get a frame grab. And for a while, that was A, obscure, and B, very expensive – and C, partly illegal. I mean, <laughs> so anyway, wow. she was a huge catch twenty two thing, and I, you know, and I was like helping her out a little bit, so she's never forgotten that. So we've, I've, not, I mean, you know, she's always been very sweet and, and everything, and I've, it's been glad. It's been nice to see people, you know, pop in and appreciate her being a sweetie too and all that. But I just, it was just a weird time when it was like the technology and everything was changing, and people didn't have their dots connected enough, and some people were falling through the cracks on different things. So. Anyway, there's your weird. There's a weird little insight yeah, from Trekland for you. Yeah. Well, it 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 also goes to some great history about you know people always think that these <clears throat> corporate entities are are so with it. Exactly, exactly, and and they don't they they don't realize that you know what no because everything. It, Everything is always changing and trying to keep up with technology and law and all of that. It's accelerate. It's, it's all it, exactly. And it's it's and it's almost like it's almost like it, my my attitude the last few years has changed a little bit because like oh five and oh six and oh seven it was very depressing because like oh we're in a fallow time and even with a movie coming whether it's good or bad it's still just a movie and we won't have a series and you know yada yada and and um, but it's almost like. Yes, everybody wants a series, but it's almost like that's a drug. It's like it's – this is so invertedly back backward to say now, but it's like those damn series, when they're cranking out hourly episodes, they're just so distracting <laughs> from all – it's like – but not having them has let everybody take a breath. Right. And explore all these other things, and that it didn't it didn't hurt that we had have had everything from oh I don't know the social media explosion, you know since True. Enterprise went off to fan production. Fan, I was gonna say any you can do anything on your damn like you can do anything on your pad you can do anything on your phone now yeah it feels <laughs> like you know much less so yeah the fan productions and just and then just out of the box things that you know geek toys the geek revolution happening yeah. big bang theory being number one sit you know being cool you don't the tv stations show up and don't go for the ugliest painted person that's fattest at the end of the day right. on sunday i mean there's just so much that's changed and the landscape has changed and it's almost like oh if we had another series come back um it just suck all the room out of all this creativity but i you know i'm kidding now but it's well, no you're it's, not what, Larry, but one of the questions I, was I, want, was I think it's a valid point. I really do. And the other, and the other thing there is, we used to think about, or I, I tried not to, but because corporations have left hands and right hands and, mm. and, and third hands if you're Tevia Corporation, but <laughs> uh, but you used to think of like monolithic Paramount, and now it's CBS, you know, whatever. But the the corporation, the corporations aren't. I mean, there's like upper level, lower level, middle level, and there's lots of with it people, just like mm -hmm. writing staffs. Their fans have penetrated and you know come, <laughs> they've covertly infiltrated everything, and that includes the the you know the offices of a lot of the corporations that that contain Star Trek and some of the competitors. 
and now it's almost a battle of who's getting who to listen to them, you know. And here's here's fans who are in a position to make some decisions, but the ones above them won't listen. So it's like you know, it's almost not fair to even say monolithic CBS or monolithic Paramount anymore because there's plenty of people who totally get it of what to do, and they're totally up with. You know, trends and fandom and what technology is doing and all the licensed stuff. Or That's like in the late 90s when the attorneys that were overseeing uh, Star Trek, the original Star Trek.com, did the cease and desist letters for all the fan sites to shut down. And Ugh. everybody at all the original Star Trek.com people were like pulling their hair out. like, no, no, what are you, like insane? And they had so much bad PR over it. But it was ahead of the curve, you know, five years later. I mean, it was, and it's like when we couldn't we couldn't mention actors in other franchises. You know, like if, if if Patrick goes over and he's Professor X at the beginning, we couldn't mention because that's a different franchise, and we're promoting their studio. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and that, that was still that old fashioned thing. Yeah, that you never yes. right. That was that Johnny Carson. At, yeah, Johnny yeah. Carson saying on another network. Yep, you know, right, yeah. He, and he, he please, wink. yeah. And winking even then, you know. Right. And then well, within I have five to, years, that all turned over, and you know, so it's it's just like an evolution sometimes. So yeah. Well, and well I'd have to admit that what I I don't want a TV show. I don't want just <laughs> a TV show. I want I want I want Star Trek on on the internet. I want Star Trek on TV. I want Star Trek different series on each of these different platforms. Give me more. Track. Well, Larry, I don't, know if you know, I don't know if you know. Almost Larry. sound like you're addicted there. Uh, so. Oh, definitely. Well, Mike and I have come up with an idea, Larry, and Mike, let, we can let Larry know about it. It's the Klingons of Long Island. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The real Klingons of Long Island. The Klingons yeah. of Long Island. Long- uh huh. Ceridium, are you going to war today or not? <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget your galoshes. It's wet out. Have a good war. Die with honor. Die with yes, honor. Yes. <laughs> well, Larry, uh, something else you were talking about, though, about the geek revolution. Oh, who cares? The la- I'm allowed to get that. Okay. <laughs> the last five Star Trek novels making the New York Times bestseller list. Which is what they used to always do, like in the 80s and 90s before, you know. I, that's, I know I saw that and was celebrating along with everybody, but it was like, wow. And I, it's like I had to go, it's, I, what, what does I mean, that mean? What does that mean? Yeah, what does it mean? It's it like means because that people, well, first off, if people are actually buying books. <laughs> how much, well, do, how much do you, you think does like Kindle help with that, though? That's what I'm wondering. Well, do they what? count? Is everything counted? Is this like counting, you know, DVR tapings along with the regular Nielsen's when you see about a show's pop? I mean, you know, are they combining everything for that? I mean, I, I hope think. I think the Kindle, I think, I think the ebooks do count, don't they? I, hope so. I think I think it's mass market paperback <laughs> and ebook all in one. I would hope it should be the title, right? Right. Right. If, whether it's on the head of a pin or not, it should all be the title. Right. But um, no, because I mean, if you you know, there they they used to be such a huge market, and they were cranking books out all the time, and there were almost more than you could keep up with if you were really trying to read all of them, unless you were like just a Excuse me, just a Voyager reader or just an original series reader or whatever. And then when the, you know, the crash came and the fallow time came and things were cut back to, you know, there for a couple of years, it was what, like six books a year or something in different. If, if we were lucky, right? Yeah. And so part of that, I don't know, some of that like a boom and bust cycle where everybody, you know, dies off or they all go bankrupt and then people get their, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's like a, a psychical thing where people have gotten hungry enough that they, or, like what we were saying a minute ago, is it a mistake that we keep like looking even even the way the landscape of five years ago or ten years ago? Is yeah. it just that we've really had so many new fans come in? I, I will give credit to J- J- again. You know? I will give credit to JJ for bringing in a whole new fan base. I mean, yeah. I think that's definitely a big part of it. I think the other part of it is you notice that since we're on our hundred and thirty first episode now that. That we've been talking with the authors and having them on our show, they're starting to make the New York Times bestseller list. Now, I'm not going to say there's a GNC bump, <laughs> but I'm just saying I'm putting, that, bump. Yeah, I'm, I'm putting that out there. Dayton Ward. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, David yeah. Mack. And Dayton Ward yeah. is yeah. into a new house. Dave, Dave. Yeah, but Dave, Dave and James Swallow and were already on the New York Times bestseller list before they were on our that's show. True. But, uh, yeah. That's true. Well, it's a, that's just blame it on the Kelvin then. Um, and Nero. <laughs> um, See, thank you, Romulans. <laughs> Romulans never got any respect. You know, you know, 
poor Insurrection and poor Michael Piller, you know I that, that movie. He, I watched it yesterday. You know, and you know this if you've read your Next Generation Companion. But um, it's going to make so me many, cry. There's so many new people. You know that the first blush out of the gate, Michael's first idea was to do a Heart of Darkness, and Picard right. had gone up river, and the whole thing, the other entity involved was going to be Romulans, <laughs> and the studio and everybody said, "Oh, Romulans are boring." <laughs> so they, they, he had to not use Romulans. So he had to invest all that time and money in what became the the Baku and the Sona and coming up with the backstory and blah 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 blah. So not only does that make you cry right there, totally opposite it chasms of who's running the boat. Who are the main villains in the next two shows movies? Uh-huh. <laughs> I didn't do it at the time because I think someone else interviewed him for a communicator. But when I knew we were doing a, a final edition of The Companion, I, I sat down with Michael. This is probably just about a year and a half before he died. At the time, it all he was fine. But I sat down and I said, okay. Because he handed me the infamous Michael Pillar, never been published book about the making of, of Insurrection. He's like, here, read this first before we talk. And I went, okay. So we did. And then I said, so – and by that time, everybody knew either uh, Nemesis was not out, but it was well known what it was going on with it. But even before – and even before you know, the J.J. movie and Nero. But I looked at him and I said, so uh, Romulans are boring, and who's the, main, you know, who's the main villain protagonist entity in Nemesis? And he looks at me like, I know, right? <laughs> you know, like, don't bring that up. It's a sore spot because he would say – and if you go back and read those notes, or hope maybe eventually if Sandra Pillar gets her way, you can read that book widely. Um, that you know, it would have saved some. It would have been a different story, a totally different vibe and feel, and it would have it would have been so much different, you know. But no, the you know that's why the Romulans weren't really in DS Nine, the Dominion War until the end. It was kind of like okay, I guess we have to bring the Romulans in. They just they just uh, compared to everything else that was exciting and crazy and wonderful. The Romulans were just kind of like. You know, at least the, at least the at least the Klingons got a makeup redo. It was almost like, can we do anything new with these guys since original series? And wow. I, I, we can get in a whole debate about the different shades and wacky doodles of what, how the Romulans were done over the years. I know, but that was a perception, and I, I just always thought it was a real tragedy that we can't like get back in the Kelvin or, or bring back Red Matter and go back and let. <laughs> Let insurrection unspool the way he originally wanted to before everybody put their fingers in the pie that were entitled to, Patrick included, and um, and sent insurrection through all these hoops and. Huh. Now yeah. there's 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 plenty to to pick on with Nemesis, but I will say, the the redesign of the the Romulan uniforms and all of that I thought was brilliant. It really brought them. Uh, it, 30 years forward, like, like the yeah. motion picture did for the Klingons. Yep. That's how long it took, but that those uniforms and and the, the, the view of the Romulan homeworld and all of that I thought was just stunning. And, it, uh, I, you know, Mike's over there smiling. I know that we're talking about how the, the Romulans got screwed, you Klingon patak. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> but, yeah, but to be fair, Larry, Mike read the Rihansu series. And, and oh. I like Romulans. Yeah. And uh, but yeah, my first my first favorite, but I like them. No, my first tattoo, Larry, was the Romulan symbol. The 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 the, 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 the Romulus and Raymond uh, clutching the twin of the bird. Yep, the bird. Yeah, yeah, that was my Very first cool. tattoo. Okay, I, I'm a believer. <laughs> because I couldn't be... leave her if I tried. Oh wait, that's oh not... yay! Okay, yay! <laughs> we always come around to monkeys with you, Terry. I know. I don't know what it is. It just dawned on me again. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Dolan's crunch. Oh, and so and so, this is hop pinging back to stellar cartography. But one Please. of the wacky things about that was going, okay, everything in its dog has been done. And I sat down to try to. I mean, number one, and we didn't say this before, and I need to say this: the artists that worked on that, uh, Ali Reese and uh, Ian Fullwood, and then Jeff Mandel had enough time. He did the the kitchen sink National Geographic. Map number ten, which has so much crammed into it, it's it's amazing. Um, which had more on it, but our poor editors at Becker Mayer were like, "No, this is like even fans' his head will explode. We have to thin this a little bit." So there's still plenty there. But uh, um, I was, you know, I didn't have a lot of time, but I did sit down to kind of see where things were. I checked out what STO had done. I kind of wanted to see what was going on, and even people in their obscure little, you know, scholarly ivory tower. 
pursuits or whatever because I had Vulcans and Klingons. And Klingons were kind of out there. They're kind of the obvious, you know. But Vulcans and, and Romulans and Cardassians, kind of in that order, were increasingly more obscure. And I was really hoping – Maybe I should say this if we ever get to do this again. I was really hoping to find some cool like fan artists because we were like – I don't want to say desperately, but we were looking for people who had really added stuff and developed this and maybe even been able to use them. And I really – I was kind of shocked to see that I didn't really um, – I mean if I have one disappointment with this, it is not about the artists at all because we were all in the same boat. I was kind of disappointed that I couldn't – we couldn't really – Push the design ethic even further than we did for the for the alien races. Even as it's it's almost tricky. It's almost like as well known as we think we know. I mean, here's what's funny: we were doing the Romulan map, and and um, and uh, I say, you know, and and the other I should say, all the artists did the art. I the way you were setting up the beginning, Terry. I I did write the guidebook, and then I basically oversaw the content for right. uh, for the map. Thank you. So, um, so we're pushing it along and seeing what we can do, and you know, and, and overseeing the actual text on them, and the you know, the placement and the whatever that. And some of them didn't need a lot of work. Some of them were just update Jeff's maps, and some of them, like the Dominion War, was like start from scratch. Start from um, scratch, right? <clears throat> but um, like the Romulan, it was kind of like you know, if you you think, oh, these idiots have been around for forty years in Star Trek, and you start looking for graphics, and it's like, well, there's that thing they had. We have the, the Warbird logo. You know, Nick's tattoo, and we have the updated one, even. And you know, but and after you get past like control console interfaces, you don't have a whole lot with all these guys. And there's the font, you know, like Mike Akuta's, you know, and and all the art people's fonts that they would use on controller. But beyond that, like everyday stuff, like what would their graphics on a map, whether it was 3D or. And we were just kind of bugging along on the Romulans, and then like at the eleventh hour, I was so stupid, I was like. The carpet map. The carpet map. <laughs> and they're like, what? Oh, yeah. the nemesis. Yes, the nemesis. Yeah. Rick, Rick Sternbach did that. And and I'm like, oh, and I wrote, I was like, Rick, do you have a, do you still have a, like a design? Because this is the world where it's a, a licensed product. But, you know, I, I, by the time I shot something off to, to Marion and my friends at CBS, and they would be like, oh, you want me to go dig out something from, I mean, <laughs> unless it, it just happened to be sitting there on top of a stack or something or digitally found, I was like, Surely I've got it here, you know. And I had just moved, which was the other thing that ate up 2013, or I was about to move. <laughs> that was the other monster that ate 2013 for me. But so I like zoom over to Rick and I go, Rick, you still have a file of the map from, you know, just a dead-on drawing. He's like, yeah. So all the things you see on the Romulan map, like the little icons for star bases and stars and the Federation versus, you know, ours versus theirs and stuff, is all off the. You know, so if nothing else, if Nemesis had never been made, the Romulan map and star cartography would have been a lot more boring. So funny how that works out. Wow. I love that story. I really do. I think that's really fascinating because if anything, uh, that's always been a point of curiosity for me has been that carpet map, that logo. What is it? You know, it's like, wait a minute. How did the logo or the symbol of the Romulan star empire – the the neutral zone was so important they made it a part of their 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 national pride <laughs> it was, it was, that would to me well, that would be like the united states symbol would be a map of the united states with like the <clears throat> the wall along the border of mexico well yeah really well, what's what's interesting is as i got into the, i mean i i kind of got this cuz i've you know i've always been a I've been a map person and with Jeff on this since like day one. That was kind of like my first splash when I was a little, a little, you know, a wee bud. But um, you, you, and then you see the, you know, the best guess scenario of a lot of fan stuff that Jeff took for the the 2003 book, and that's we basically didn't reinvent the wheel. We took that and then updated or fixed or tweaked or whatever. But when you start thinking about what does that, what does that really mean for the psyche of Romulans? Right, the treaty that they did in the dark, you know, 200 years earlier, and they've made the neutral zone. You know, it's like they're they're three fourths walled off from the you know, and then they then they have their bumper zone over here where they're bashing in with the Klingons every you know. There's something right. happening all the time, and just because it's quiet between the Feds and the Romulans doesn't mean it's not quiet. You know, the uh, uh, Narendra Three and the Kedar massacre all happened when they were 
you know, from the Federation point of view, it's all, we haven't had any contact with them in 50 years, you know, but boy, they're still banging heads with the Klingons over here. And, but you look at their thing and you think, my God, it's kind of like, it's like, it's like East Berlin, you know? Right. Yeah. It's like they're walled in behind this thing. And it's, and then you think it looks like it's like an oval sperm because it's like the only place they've got to expand where no one cares is out the back door. Right. And I know we're looking at this all very two dimensionally, but right. that's, you know, but that's, so if you look at the map, it's kind of like, oh, so it's like, this is the goofy stuff that, that like informs, can inform you on something. You know, I mean, it's like it, you start to go, oh, what can I pull from this? Right. So anyway, it really I, does. It adds so much background. You, it as, as obscure as just a map could be, right? As obscure as how much uh, background and, and how much character you can pull. From that, as a Star Trek fan yeah. or even a writer, and Social I just think it's fun. Stuff. And, it, right. and and the Romulans more than anybody else. What would it be like to be like this psyche? Like, well, fuck, we agreed to this stupid treaty, and here it is. Two hundred. I mean, I'm amazed the Romulans aren't trying to peck out of that thing every five or ten years. I mean, if you stop and think about it, they've walled yeah. the three fourths of their thing. They've walled off their growth potential three fourths <laughs> of the way around. <laughs> Like we're in a two-dimensional space, and they've only got that back end to go to. So anyway, it's just – it's like one of those things when you jump into it, you're kind of drowning in it or wallowing it, and you go, oh. So you know, it's like that's a d- dynamic that, that can be brought into the psyche of what drives individual Agreed. ambulance, their governments, and blah, 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 and all that stuff. So I, I don't know if you see this is – I know the, the STO has gotten into the whole – you know, the Hobus supernova and the battle over the new capital and all that stuff for sidebars, but yeah. – um, because the, the Klingons, by contrast, are just kind of like, okay, we're friends to everybody, so let's just turn and we've got this whole back end to go to. And, and they're expanding out. They look like the Soviet Union coming. What was weird was we'd get into doing these maps and I started making like the Cardassians into North America and the Romulans into Europe. And I was talking about the Northern Front coming through Iceland. Oh, wait, that's not Iceland. That's the Ferengis. And it was <laughs> – it was, it was strange. But anyway, but no, that's – and – you can't go through something in three months and, and all these slices of topics, you know, because we had everything from all these wars and historical periods and alien points of view. And it was like my, my old brain, like we, we, this isn't like communicator fact files days, kids. I mean, I would love for it to be that way all the time. But that was, there was a time when we were like chewing on this stuff all the time and to kind of like light the fire under all that stuff, you know, and um, get the boilers going again. <laughs> and jump in up to your eyeballs with everything again. It was a lot of fun, but it was like, wow. And then to realize what else has you know been done, what are people doing, and like I said, looking for art, but also getting back into stuff that sat. This all got going because you mentioned the Rihansu again. And right. I reached out to Diane Duane, and, re- and, and um, Mark Okren sent me a new Klingon word for something that was stupidly very galactic Englishy in the middle of the Klingon Empire, so I wanted to get a Klingon word for it. So it was just it was just a lot of fun to get back and see what had been done or revisit some of these things or look at three or four fan versions and maybe pick best pieces of things and, you know, which was kind of heady because that's what they were doing on Enterprise the last, you know, Mike Sussman is pulling Andorian things out of an old Andorian gaming manual that, you know, I, for proper names and things. So it was, it was just a lot of fun. I wish we'd had a little more time, but um, now I just want to do, you know, do some new tangents, and all all suggestions will be greatly appreciated. As well as there is a corrections list. I know there's some stuff that got omitted that I thought Jeff's maps had everything, and I kept finding things that weren't, and then there were even more things. So those are welcome too. But I'm really looking for like you know if we come up with enough cool stuff, and and uh, and hopefully another year or so goes by, and uh, you know John Van Sitters wins his war to in- increase more nonfiction for Trek, uh, maybe we can do something different next time around. Well, now, I, how long I, I did forgot to, well, oh, I forgot to have you? Oh, <laughs> oh you kids! I, I know. Well, Larry, real quick, Larry, you, you mentioned this. And I forgot to tell Mike this on Sunday. Hey, Mike, at a far point, I sat down and I talked with uh, Mark O'Gran for a while. So yeah, there's that. Right on. He's right such on. a sweet guy. I mean, he really is. That's awesome. It, it, well, it was. I met him right after Alan Dean Foster. Because it's like what is like Klingonese is like the. It's the I know it's bigger than any other fictional language, but it's like probably spoken by more people than some tiny little tribal languages that have been around. Oh yeah, in year. Yeah, it's just kind of weird to look. I mean, and I know Jimmy Doohan gets credit for coming up with the, you know, the chompy stuff that they used in the 
teaser of motion picture, but then they had to make it make sense, and that's where Mark came in. But um, it's something to be like the originator of a language that's only no spoken by people that choose to speak it. <laughs> you know, uh, and for him to be just as kind of laid back and wacky as he is, it's kind of it's very cool. I you had a you. question, Michael. I did. <laughs> uh, it slipped my mind at the moment. Oh no. Um, uh, it'll come back to me. I'll, hopefully, I'll. Uh, oh, sorry, my thought, but there No, it's fine. It's fine. It's, um, yeah. So go ahead. Okay, I was just going to ask. In in total, <clears throat> between the time that the the idea kind of really started to take, uh, or to 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 get some uh, legs, so to speak, mm-hmm. how long did the actual project take for you to get it out to and published? Uh, stellar cartography. How long did it take all all together? Well, I'll just say real quick, the driving idea was um, was our friend John Van Sitters at CVS Licensing, CVS Consumer Products. Um, Becker Mayer, who's a book publisher, I, I learned a lot about the way book, modern book publishing is now. So the mm-hmm. publisher is Amazon through their 47 North uh, brand. Becker Mayer is a book publisher, a book packager, excuse me, who like basically does all the creative – they're the ones who, who budget and pay for people that do the editing and the creative design and do the lic- like joint licensing with 47 North. But 47 North for Amazon, per their business model of their just warehousing stuff, is just kind of like the last – they're like the last step on the, on the path. <laughs> it's okay. printed, and they warehouse it, and then they sell it. So all the guts of it, all the thinking up front part is Becker Mayer and my wonderful editor, uh, Dana Ulan and um, – Joanne, um, Rosanna, who is our art director on this. And they had wanted to do a really big, thick book, and John had said, why don't we do something smaller? They also had wanted to do something within like a year's time frame, and John was cautioning against that. Now, a couple things. They, Becker Mayer does everything from generic stuff to franchise things, but they always try to do out-of-the-box presentations. And they had done a couple of Star Wars Things, a, a Sith and a Jedi thing that were kind of very cool. They were in like containers that, whatever. And Becker Mayer through Amazon 47 North did the uh, did David Goodman's book Federation the first 150 years that came on the pedestal with the Admiral right. Sulu address and all that. Right. So that was kind of the tweak of that. And they had wanted to do a really huge thing. So John had suggested, well, let's do something back and knowing how. And again, I I the years are piling up faster, and I. Didn't think about how frustrating it was. I just knew me. I didn't think about large scale. How frustrating it was. As cool as the 2003 Star Charts book that Jeff did is, it's all those little pages, and people people were aching to have big foldouts, yep. you know, and and they're like scanning and and uh, cobbling it together online for images and stuff. So, uh, so the the maps idea came from them, and they kind of roughed out some ideas, and John said, "You should have Larry work on this." And uh, we got Jeff involved to the extent that he could because he was working on two TV shows at the time as a graphic mm-hmm. uh, supervisor. So, um, so, yeah, they came at me and said, here, what do you think of this? And I threw a lot of stuff back at them for the – you know, it was a guidebook and maps. And my thing, of course, I'm going, oh, this is so cool. It's an homage to the 1980 maps. And they're all like, what? <laughs> and I said, oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> so the first time we all met live, I went, here, this is what I meant. And I had my old little 1980 – you know, the two big double-sided fold-out maps and a little paperback book. And they're like, oh, we had no idea. I said, well, this is much cooler because this will be for real, and it's on the one that's kind of gotten established now. But anyway, for old-timers, it was like a kind of a – almost like a subtextual homage. That's but awesome. but yeah, so anyway, so I said, okay, da, 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 and then we just kind of went from there and tweaked some of the ideas. And I went, okay, this will be fairly straightforward. This one, <laughs> this will be from you – know, the, these alpha-beta things, that will be easy. This Dominion War one, I'm going to do – have to do a ton of work on that. And I relish it because I can fix a lot of stuff that's been wandering around the wilderness, You know, people confused or whatever. So that's one thing about having some distance. You know, All these last right. 10, 15 years, you've had time for some things to kind of gestate. And, and then how do we do – Deal with you know, and to me it was like, well, we have to do with the you know with the um, Romulus explosion, the Prime from JJ, and um, and then the last of Enterprise, and the whole fit the uh, how the hell does the Zindi Expanse fit into this? And um, uh huh, you know, those are the two main new things, and then everything else was like fixing and filling in, and and then the alien perspectives. You know, what what do we do with that, and how do we take that, and what's so I came up with the let's do the Klingons on the the height of Organia on the eve of Organia and let's do the Romulans and Cardassians here and and I and um, 
the Vulcans at the death of Serac and make it a real ancient thing. Also, we kept talking about the ancient Vulcans, the ancient Vulcans who have nuclear weapons and warp drive. So it was kind of, <laughs> what does that do? Because I keep having these like papyrus Egyptian images <laughs> only with people with warp drive. It could clearly do probably holography and stuff. So anyway, so that, yeah, so that's, a, so your question. Um, so they came to me in December. We jumped on it in January. It was supposed to be three months. It stretched into like May just because passes going back from the – we went through three passes uh, with the uh, like uh, artists and then back to me. And then I had John and I had Dana um, as backup, but it was primarily on my shoulders. So, um, And they, we'd all catch stuff, but it was kind of me watching for stuff. And then it kept evolving. I kept finding things as we went along. Oh, crap. This never – you know what? Jeff didn't have this in his book? Okay, we've got to put this in. You know, Or crap, here's another one that, that was a DS9 thing that didn't get put in back then or whatever. So – <laughs> I remember my question. <laughs> Good. Yeah, yeah. See, that was that's, so. So, so we wrapped it up by the end of May. It was printed in China, which took six months, which is why it barely got back into the country uh, in time for holiday shopping. End of end of uh, first of December. I'm, yeah, I'm still surprised it, it only took you months because it's it's so beautiful and it's so detailed. I, I it it gives you the impression that it, you guys took years to do it. It's oh, that good. beautiful. Good, good. And the and the <laughs> artists appreciate it. They're all great, and they have their you know their toolbox of of tricks and things. But um, well, it took forty seven years. It was forty seven well, years in the making. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And then the fa- oh, and then the fact that it cost the the, the discount price is forty seven ninety nine. I just the first time I saw that, I just hooted and hooted. I said, "Did somebody do this on purpose?" And they all kind of looked at me blankly. So I was like, "Okay, here we go." It's just too perfect. <laughs> right on. Well, um, before you forget, we had we have been reading um, uh, Mark Cushman's "These Are the Voyages," mm-hmm. and they kind of go back and look at um, the, the the original series on a, a, a season basis and and tell all the little backstories involved. Yeah. It, I'm so jealous because he got to sit and read through memos, which is like, that, you can't get any better <laughs> reading through memos. It's like, it's like geek nirvana. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. But uh, any chance that we might you, – you had, you had mentioned that you were looking at possibly the next big project. Any chance something similar to that can, can – that you'd be involved in something similar to that? Well, I – okay. I can't – I don't want to say anything. I'll just say this. John Van Sitters has this wish list of things. Some things have been on that wish list for 10 or 12 years. So when I tell people, hey, if you think we're having a mini boom in nonfiction – and not even just reference books, but like cool stuff like David's book and, and the maps and everything. It's like, I hate to sound commercial, but like go buy it and then like write and comment and, you know, social media eyes and everything. Because mm-hmm. that's the way stuff's going to get done. Now, we have this looming thing on our, you know, long range scans, actually not so long range, called the 50th anniversary, yeah. which if you're a marketer, it's like you don't get that. You get that once a generation, right? It's the gold. It's the it's the golden. Yeah, it's the, the yes. big one. Yeah, yeah, the big one. So, you know, and and it's the golden shower. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're thinking something else. Am I? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, oh, I won't. I won't even touch that. Um, what she said. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so anyway, so it's like if you it, it, it's ridiculous not to be thinking about how much cool stuff you can roll out. And I don't want to get into like this, uh, you know, franchise envy thing. But if all these tentpole movies and the franchises, and now you know all the comic book ones and Wars and Harry Potter and all the other whatever else is out there, James Bond, I don't know, um, you know, DC and 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 Marvel. But it's like if you're really going to roll out a whole bunch of cool stuff. And the way the landscape has changed, and we've got so much, you know, digital and online and out of the box wacky doodle things. Do stuff. I mean, this is a long way of saying I hope he gets enough attention to get hires up corporately or enough, enough, you know, wheels greased, enough people all pointing the same way. There's a lot of people that want to do a lot of things, cool things for the 50th anniversary. I don't know. I think a new series would be nice too, but, yes. you know, yes. aside from just another, I don't mean to say just another JJ movie. I'm actually kind of excited about this third one. Are I you? Think I'm. In a very weird, peculiar way, I almost just think that because of the shakeup and how it's being done, I almost think if the pressure goes off and there's a shakeup in personnel, that maybe yeah. 
that maybe this may be the one that doesn't – I mean I always thought that the motion picture had so much politics and so many hands in it that it's maybe. amazing that it ever got done. And then Wrath of Khan was like the, well, you know, well, fine, let the TV division do it you know, kind of reaction, and then bang. So I almost um, – I, huh. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being very early on. I, I'm, you know, and I'm the guy that never liked. I mean, I don't, don't think I didn't like, but it would not have been my choice to do an alternate universe because I think everybody is so spooked about the cannon rock around their neck that I think it's it's overly spooked way too many people. But I'm just going to say I'm going to be guardedly. I don't even know if optimistic is the word to say about a third movie. I just like to think that the the landscape has been so shifted and there's been so much pressure taken off and people like, oh, they're all looking over here and they're looking over here. Maybe it'll surprise us. But that said, you can do you need to do a lot more with the 15th anniversary than have one movie. You know, that's the third one of a series. I I don't yeah. think there's a fan out there who would disagree with that. I really don't. Which I mean, part? Uh, the whole about it can't just be. As, mm-hmm. as yeah. nice as a film will be, it can't just be yeah, one more. film. Yeah. It has let, to be. It has yeah. to be a a, a genre wide celebration. And for, well, forget fans. What if you're a marketing? What if you're corporate at yeah. suit? Get, get, you're going to let the get, 50th get anniversary go by without planning a bunch of stuff and hopefully having smart people doing it, not having it be a waste of time, crap. But you know, I mean, you ought to be shot if you let your franchise's 50th anniversary go by and you don't do stuff that's going to make you a ton of money. Right. <laughs> you know, no, you're right. That's exactly it. Yeah. It, so it's very, very true. <clears throat> I mean, if if you haven't learned that from Disney now, then you are. Oh, and Disney's are the ma- Disney's the master. They're masters. Yeah, right. and they own everything now, but Star Trek. So you know, <laughs> this is very true. <laughs> Just about that. that what's what's left of you know Firefly or something? But um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So I'll, so I would love to do more stuff like this again. I'd love to keep hearing people's ideas. I mean, I'm so fried. I don't want to say it fried me, but I just realized how out of shape I was when we got through the maps. But I was like, but if I was doing this all the time, I would. It's all about the cardio, time. Larry. You got to yeah. work on the cardio. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the Romeo and the Klingonio yeah. and the Borgio and the okay <laughs> and the Folio. Um, <laughs> So bad. I think we need to wrap it up shortly, uh, yep. very oh. shortly. But uh, on before the, we do, okay, I couldn't I, let cardio I, go by. Come on. When you do the uh, Geek Nation tours, are you going to the Cliffs of Bowl? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're going to Ditalix B actually, and we're seeing the Andorian that was uh, hijacked and kidnapped and <laughs> in his place. Um, See, the Cliffs of Bowl was in a Deep Space Nine episode. Yes, yes, so it, not, is. it sure uh, is. He's even like the rare person that's had two things named after him, which is kind of amazing. So they liked Cliff. I think he liked, uh, yeah. That's a high compliment, though, that a director is that well liked. Yeah, well, Rick Colby was the same way. I mean, the, if you look and see who had the most, you know, the stats, Rick didn't get like things named after him. They just like making fun of his German accent. And, and he passed away a couple of years ago. He was yeah. older than I remember him being, but. Um, and it's one of those things where, like, they waited a month or two to kind of, you know, the family or whatever, quietly let the word get out or whatever. But, um, yeah. Yeah, I don't like this litany of um, – and A.C. Lyles passed away. Like He was 90-something. Yeah. But I, I haven't written anything. I'm still going to write something for him. I, that happened right at the end of my crazy time. But um, it just makes you appreciate the, the passing years and how many of these creative folks um, – I mean, I, I feel like how privileged I was back, even if I hadn't kept up with them, which I feel badly about, um, back in the day. And there's a couple of them that I didn't ever get to talk to the, the last four or five years. Uh, um, uh, Jeff, not Jeff Corey, um, Corey, um, the director of the Next Gen Pilot, uh, and he did a few other shows. I didn't ever get to talk to him until four or five years ago, and he was elderly, and but he still, had, you know, he um, we had a very slow and very quiet interview. But I got to ping his mind about an awful lot of stuff, and I'm just I'm just glad I did. And yeah, there's neat. people on that list that you like. Uh, have I, you know, who's who's out there that I haven't got to talk to yet? And no, you know, I realized I realized I was old now when <laughs> one of my favorite albums is 25 years old, and I said, "How did the hell did that happen?" Yeah, you know, when you realize that U2 is the Joshua Tree is 25 years old. Yeah. And right. How ever bridge listen that? to Terry. Listen to Terry realizing that. What? It's what? <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember three or four years ago when 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 we had the 45th anniversary, which is like they you know they market it and they kind of do some 45ish things. 
but it was at Vegas, and, and somebody says about the 45th, and it's like it hadn't hit me until like right that moment, but the moment it hit me that, oh my God, the next you know anniversary, air quotes, is a real one. The, it's like the 50th. Yeah. You know, we're not bopping along here 25, 30, 35. It's like, oh my God. And it, that, I just remember being a little like silently staggered in my boots that, you know, oh my God, 50? Really? Okay. Well, we've when lost real- a lot of people. Yeah. But- when I realized that soldiers I work with were not, were not even born like when I went to war the first time. <laughs> that will, that will, uh, no, it's when, and I love, I love all the people to pieces. But now I have people coming up to me and going, uh, like, uh, would you sign my companion? And I'm like, oh, sure, sure, yeah. This was, God, this was like, everybody in fifth grade was so <laughs> jealous of me when this came out. And I'm like, okay. But it, it's like, that's cool. And it's, and it's, I remember how, uh, B. Joe Trimble, and how Franz Joseph Schnabel, and how um, uh, David Gerald, and how um, uh, who am I leaving out? Uh, uh, um, shit. Uh, uh, um, wrote the making of Star Trek. Uh, Stephen Poe, Stephen Whitfield, and his real name was Poe. Um, I remember thinking how you know, just you just grew up with the stuff, and I didn't even think about the people. And then when I got chances to meet all of them finally. Uh, you know, B. Joe was, you know, B. Joe, but he, I, like Stephen Poe was a very specific person, and he got the chance to redo the same kind of a book for Voyager and to meet him. And he was kind of overwhelmed that, I mean, like Mike and, you know, Mike <laughs> Rick Sternbach and all the fans and closet fans on the staff when he was around the lot were bringing in their old copies <laughs> for him to sign, and he was just kind of like overwhelmed. It, it really is kind of, it makes you stop and. And think, well, okay, well, I'm glad I had, like, you know, I was an embarrassment to society when I did this. I, hopefully, it's, apparently, I affected some people. Enjoy, you know, people had a good time, and and that's great. You know, it, well, it this added. conversation has taken a turn where I'm now pouring myself some vodka. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> did I send it there? I really no. It's, I've been going through this a lot lately. When you know, just realizing <laughs> that you, yeah, we were we were at far point, and a song came on, and a friend of mine, she's an author, Kelly Metting, was there, and I said, "Oh, this was my prom theme," and she was like, "A Bon Jovi song was your prom theme," and I said, "Shut up, just shut up." <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I got him beat. I think ours was sticks. Um, Dude, that's just wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's also cool because five or ten years ago, I was like going, I gotta, I gotta go out and get a real job. I've got it. Well, I still need to do that. <laughs> but it's like, <laughs> I need to become really good at selling shoes or something because this is all so old and moldy, old. And if there's not a new show to keep, you know, like the press is turning to keep churning stuff out, no one is gonna care. They thought everybody's heard these stories and they know these facts and they know this crap and they've seen these pictures and they know these explanations and. Everybody knows this already, and it slowly started dawning on me. No, they don't. You know, they don't. it's and the it's, next generation. It's the next generation, and and something you said earlier, Nick. It's what and what people have even like thrown it in my face the last year or two at conventions, especially. It's not just the JJ movies. Absolutely not. It's right. the Correct. Netflix. It's yep. the Blu-rays and all the publicity yep. with them. It's those those one-hour Fathom event things. People. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've had people that go. One girl was adamant. She was like in her twenties, and she's like, "Absolutely not. It was not the JJ movies." I go, "What was it?" She says, "My friends." And I'm like, "Yeah." Yep. You know, she's like, "I yes, I have Trek friends and blah blah." And I go, "Well, they just they just now did it." She's no, they've been after me for ten years. But I just it, you know, finally. But it connects it. everything. Yeah, yep. It just finally it, did. William Shatner's The Captains and Rod Roddenberry's Truck Nation and all of that. It's you know it's it's all interweaving and I I think social media is one of the huge drivers yeah. of that. Yeah, agreed. You have all those coupled up, but social media now with Netflix and it's all there. Correct. And that's like right. DS9 and even Enterprise. I, I love what Doug Drexler said about. Um, Kind of when we were, t- I talked to him about you're really putting your name on this drive to get Netflix to do a fifth season of Enterprise. Oh, oh, and I have one more soapbox thing to say, but real quickly, Doug said we've had a whole generation of fans come along for Enterprise who don't know they were supposed to hate it. Yeah. Oh, beautifully phrased. Yeah. And it's like it's like and it, the bigger thing of we're gonna you know we will eventually get we still have lots of people around but they're getting smaller a smaller pool of people who actually saw the original series on primetime NBC weekly you know right and there were tons of people next gen all the modern TV shows saw but there's we're gonna get to a time when people only know things 
the way I it dawned on me about ten years ago, the way they are in Europe and the other foreign markets. Star Trek to them is just the wall. Of, I think I've probably told you guys this little phrase: the wall of boxes, the wall of tapes. You know, right. everything is equal to them. It's like the kids. When my kids were little, and I realized on Cartoon Network before Boomerang, Cartoon Network, and they could they could watch the thing made last year right next to the Flintstones, right next to Wacky Races, right next to something. You know, it's like no, no, my time deserves this thing all to itself, but it was all the same to them, you know, and then they compared things and said, well, this is crappy drawn compared to that. It's like, you don't know that there's 20 years difference, and, you know. So, but we're getting that way where the Americans are that way, where our domestic people are that way. Pretty soon, most fans are not going to have known that, well, they did this Cupid show on Next Gen because there were two Robin Hood movies that year. You know, it doesn't matter, or whatever. Or 9-11 happened, and all of a sudden, Enterprise got dark, you know? I mean, it's like... It's, it's right. Good. So that that's all. Good. So that's all part of the new. I forget why I got off on this, but that's part of the new. Oh, so very quickly, I had yep. given some advice. If I don't say anything else today, so everybody talking about future and new series and what it'll be and all that stuff and will we have it sooner than later? Very a very wise person told me, <laughs> if nothing else, the Netflix thing and and as much as people rat on Les Moonves about hating sci-fi and hating Star Trek maybe, but one thing about him, he does – he appreciates something that makes money. And apparently Les Moonves told like their whatever quarterly corporate you know, message to the shareholders or whatever, went out of his way to point out that of all the CBS properties on, on Netflix – with NCIS, the granddaddy, number one runaway, about to spin off another show, with Scott Bakula as the lead. Apparently. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and with um, Big Bang Theory as the number one sitcom in their stable, right. the number one Netflix property is – ta-da! Yes, you've started. Yeah. Now, yeah. they have 700 and something hours, but there's probably almost that many of NCIS. But that made an impression on old Les even. And Netflix is – you know, this whole revolution of the – you don't have to be CBS or ABC or even you know Doodah Cable Channel. You can be Netflix and come up with shows that are winning Emmys nominations. You know, that's okay. right. So here's the piece of advice: it's like um, get Netflix and even more. So, and, and you know, there's there's. Um, uh, uh, I agree. Amazon Prime. Get Netflix. Start watching Star Trek. Even if you're not watching it, put it on the back room. Go in the kitchen, yep. make dinner, yep. go iron your shirts, do whatever the hell yep. it is you do. But leave it on and let the ticker roll. Yep. Turn the sound Good down. Good advice. You know, just like go out and buy ten copies of Stellar Cartography. No, but I mean, <laughs> let those tickers <laughs> run. And CBS appreciates making some pennies off each one, but it's the bigger symbol of, oh my God, look at these numbers. Oh my God, you know, it's the modern day. It's like the Nielsen's again. Right. It adds foundation to the value of their. IP. Yes. Yep. But it's like don't just sit and watch it when you feel like watching it unless it kills you. Turn the sound down and just let it you know, go on vacation and leave your TV on with Netflix. <laughs> I mean, on- when there's nothing on, I watch Star Trek. On, yes. And and exceedingly there's less and less for me to enjoy watching on television. Well, that's so exactly. I'm watching more and more tracks. That's, that's it. it, it I, just before you came on, Larry, I was talking with with Terry and Mike and I said, I have two appointment shows now. Just two. Walking Dead and Arrow. That's it. Yeah, and I have um, Agents of Shield and Which Sleep it, Hollow. It is, Agents of Shield is, but because of the Olympics and all of that, it's been off. So once it's back, on, back that on the force, yeah, yeah, that and that tells you something. Yeah, that tells you something. It, it's totally appointment television for me if I actually know the date that it's coming back. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, that's big. Yeah. Well, it's for like, me, oh, I, I actually know. How long its hiatus is? <laughs> For me, it's been the blacklist, mm-hmm. and um, and we started off watching Agents of Shield just because it was a Josh show, and then but I knew kind of it really wasn't. It was he was EPing it, and I know it kind of got flat, and we got away, and then I know we I watched the sh- I watched the episode that was it the one that Jonathan directed? Who was it? It was some Trek person directed. It was Jonathan. Yeah. Yes. Was yes. Jonathan. Yeah. And it was a good one, and I think that's the last one I saw, and I got out of. The recording got turned off or something or whatever, and I haven't been watching it. But that's – but yeah, I, that's the way I've been the last 10 or years or so. It's like I have maybe one or two shows that are – you know, that are the appointment yeah. shows. And the rest of the time, I'm watching Trek. So, right. you know, yeah. so it, it's it's quality television, even though it's – some of it's going on 50, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's still attracting <laughs> fans. There's That's people right. that sit down and watch the, 
you know, and uh, the Blu-rays and the remastering have helped that with original and next gen. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that whole thing of the old, you know, I can't watch it because the effects are so bad. They have those plywood sets with the Christmas lights. But once you get sucked in, you don't you're like everybody else. You don't pay attention to that. Right. Which yeah. I never thought was that big a deal anyway. But something real fun, Larry, my fiance is uh, she's watching the original series on Netflix and, she, you know, she saw it, you know, 30 years ago, whatever, but she never really paid attention to it. Mm-hmm. So now she's watching it because she went to Vegas with us last year and she's going back this year and, and all of this. One of the funny things was her daughter, who's 17, um, oh, was it the man trap? It was the man trap. And her daughter was like, why is that woman serving them coffee about about Yeoman Rand? She was like, is that what she does? But it's real interesting to see a 17-year-old woman of today looking at what people didn't even blink an eye at back then. You oh, know, yeah. the Yeoman oh, yeah. bring in coffee. And as my fiance is going through it, to, uh, it'll be so interesting to watch as she goes through then Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. And I can't wait, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, for her to get to Voyager. Because right. then they're going to see a female captain, mm-hmm. you know, and, and how they react to that. So I think that'll all be really interesting. And then a couple of badass females along with the female captain then. Oh, yeah. 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 Yep. Kidding? No kidding. No, no so Larry. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're we're reminiscing a lot, um, and and getting some great stuff. But I kind of using that that kind of as a segue, um, to talk about because I don't want to forget. We want to talk about your your trunk sales. Oh oh trunk, oh yeah. Trunk. Well, that's a little bit that's reminiscing, but no, this is just something that. Speaking of the big crazy move, um, when we moved last year, I was like, okay, I have all this stuff, and I, I I've got my McCoy things, but I didn't, re- I don't really have a ton of just commercial stuff. I quit doing that years ago, but I got them like archive archives, like old scripts and set plans and and graphics and things, and I realized you can scan all that. I, I don't want to ever give up the information, but. Um, so what I've started doing is I, I wanted to be able to you know share that I wanted, couldn't give it away but I wanted to get a lot of that out after I scanned or photographed stuff but I also didn't want to be the smarmy used car guy popping up on the internet and going okay kiddies here's uh you know <laughs> come over to Uncle Larry's and look at look at you know come in my garage and look and see what I got I didn't want to do that all the time so I just came up with this. You know, use the Trekland brand, and the, and so the trunk. <laughs> no, oh, I'm just you guys, Larry, have... Larry rolling up in a van. Hey, kid, you want to see my Star Trek stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think what's great is I know that hey, he's, kids, you're you're work, you're getting into voiceover now, and I'm like, okay, the character you just portrayed there was really. Yeah. <laughs> I've always done this. I just never thought about it seriously. That's kind of <laughs> this, is, this is what being an empty nester does to you. All of a sudden, all that all that energy that went into like raising kids and stuff. But no, it's like yeah, yeah. Hey, kid, you want to see my jump just stick? <laughs> Um, <laughs> and if you're not a DS nine or see you missed that one. Oh my gosh. But uh so yeah, so I have this just simple Facebook page, the Trekland Trunk, and then there's a there's a Twitter for it also, Trekland Trunk. And I that's my seller's name on eBay and come like the page and then when I I have three or four things up like every week that run about five days and and it's all ninety nine percent of the stuff is all like not commercial. It's all early, early first drafts, or it's set plans, or it's some paste up Okudagram boards type things, you know, or from those days, or it's promotional googie things, or it's all you know uh, stickers and labels. Um, it's all There's really obscure, really rare, nice rare stuff. stuff. And something, you know, if you're a Voyager fan, you might want to care about this, but not if you're a DS, you know, or if you're just a Trek fan overall. And things are <clears throat> things are really kind of going less than I thought they would, but that's okay. It's you know, some things are obviously bigger than others and appeal to more people and that kind of thing. But um, but the biggest thing is, I, and occasionally I will go over and say, hey. Voyager fans, Janeway fans, look at look what could have been Janeway in a wagon train instead of Gothic Janeway, and you know, for her holodeck program. So I'll do that, but most of the time it's just kind of like here it is. And then once a week or so, we if it's something that's a little wackier that I don't think is like prime eBay material, as if it, you know, if it's right. something a little stranger, I'll just I kind of had hacked this together because Facebook doesn't make it easy, but. 
I'll I'll put it up. I'll put these items up and say who will we'll, we'll do like a six hour. They're all live bidding, but a six hour thing on Facebook, and people sign in and they make sure they're friended, and then we do it in a group chat, and people just bid for six hours, which is they have more fun in that because people role play, and I've got one guy oh, that bids fun. as a Breen, and it's kind of funny, but. Um, but there's like it's almost like a there's a <laughs> that's a eight riot. to ten to twelve there's eight to ten to twelve regulars that jump in and then occasionally other people do too. So but they they're they're getting people are getting good deals on I mean those are things that I don't expect to be such big things, but people um have fun, you know, doing that. And then uh, it's all you know, it's all still through PayPal and everything. So um so that, yeah. And then, real That's quick, funny. I should say that the Con of Wrath is not dead. We actually, it almost was dead last year, but we're getting back to work on that. And that's something that we're trying. This is scary to say, but I'm trying to aim for the 50th anniversary year as a as a as a cutoff time. But I've got a couple of hurdles to get over. But uh, that's at least putting my you know back to the wall kind of a thing and lighting a fire under my butt and, and moving along with it. So, well, if there's our anything documentary to help. Let us know. Okay, I'll, I've got my list of forty-seven things I'll send you. Oh yay, forty-seven <laughs> things! Don't say that unless you mean it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we need to tie things up. And Larry, again, thank yeah. you so much for joining us. As always, you're always such a pleasure to talk to and a blast. It's just always so much fun. Oh, you guys! No, thanks for having me on. As long as, as, long as we have our list of to-do things, leave your leave your Netflix on. <laughs> right. And yes. uh, you know, watch Star Trek continues. And, right. Uh what else? Uh uh go go sign up for the Trekland trunk and uh, And go on a Geek Nations tour. Yeah, go on a Geek Nations tour. And don't, and don't forget to buy uh Trek non fiction. Yes, 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 yes. Anywhere and Especially Star Trek stellar cartography. Especially yes. Star Trek cartography. While it's on that special forty seven ninety nine <laughs> price or whatever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, guys, thanks a lot. It's all, it's, uh, Thank you, Larry. It's, uh, I always, I hate, to, there's so much crap going on, and none of it's making me any money, but that's okay. But <laughs> there is so much stuff I enjoy talking. These are great in between the conventions because we all kind of have to, like, do a, right. do a reality check because fandom, you know, pop culture and everything online and digital and much less trectum and entertainment industry and just the way everything works, it cha- every nine months it changes. It's true. You know, it's like you get you're, yeah. you get lulled to sleep thinking, oh, that was the way it was way back in 2013, you know, and <laughs> good grief. So anyway, it's, I, I enjoy keeping, you know, we all got to stay sharp right. and be aware of stuff. And it, it's just little, these little, you know, mind explosions that happen. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know. So anyway, Did you just light say bulbs, mime light explosions. Mind, mind, not oh, mind. Oh, I thought you said mind. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Did you know the Romulan mines were really a gardening mulch contraption? Uh, <laughs> uh, those kind of. I was thinking, you know, some some guy in a trapped in a box, <laughs> <laughs> spontaneously exploding. Oh, well, that's where my mind's the at. The self-replicating Anyways. mines on DS9 that they redid for the one on, on the Enterprise were, those, uh, are those were gardening uh, things that were like big spheres. And yeah, and the gardening company, when they started buying them for that, put out a press release about how they were, <laughs> how they were so thrilled to be part of Star Trek. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I came across that the other day, the photo in the press release. I was like, I've got to, you know, it's like, oh, this is not old to many people. This is wacky new to a lot of people. That's great. Anyway, guys, thanks a lot. This has been a Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Larry. Okay, guys, take care. I'm glad everybody's feeling better. Yeah, Yeah, take care. I'd like to thank Mr. Larry Nemechek for joining us at G&T Show Supplemental Log. Join us again on our regular show, episode 132, on Sunday, March 2nd. Have a great week, everybody, and take care. Kapla. Joe Lantro. GNT Show is a busy little beaver production. Music for the GNT Show is provided by Warp 11, Grethor, Five Year Mission, and Andrew Allen's Smooth Federation.